So I'm doing tibial plateau. And um, this may sound a little patronizing, but there's nothing in this talk that I'm giving today that is unattainable by anyone. This is not an exercise in showboating or anything. This is just entirely, this is all stuff that I think that anyone in this room could, could do. And this talk comes in two halves. Uh, I'm talking about principles and some technical tips. And all the principles I put down too, it's really kind of one. And it sort of hinges around this. This dude, Lou, Lo, Lo rather, Lo, Kong Feng Lo, in 2010, he came up with this, this concept, if you like, of the three-column model of proximal tibial fractures. And this was a change in our thinking, because up until then, we thought of them as two condyles, you know, medial or lateral condyles. And so this was like a change in thinking, and, and he kind of linked it to surgical approaches to the back of the knee. So you kind of, you have your, you have your, um, model which tells you which ones need fixing from the back and then it also tells you which approach you should be using. So it was an elegant kind of uh, combination of concepts. The trouble is though, I'm just going to go back a slide, the posterior column of the tibial plateau comes in two flavours, a posterior medial and a posterior lateral and they behave very differently and so by thinking of it as just posterior it is somewhat misleading. Here is a tibial plateau fracture. This is just a Schatzka II like you get every day in, uh, on the trauma board. And you can see there's your depressed fragment, you can see on the left-hand view. And on the right-hand side, the axial CT, what is that? That is a posterolateral fracture, right? Oh my God, does that mean I need to do a posterior approach to the knee to fix this? And the answer is that the posterolateral fragment is generally tightly bound to the fibula. The fibula kind of protects it as a, like a buttress, if you like. It's like the plate's already on. Um, the knee generally does not sublux posterolaterally. It does not move off with that fragment. So unless it's very displaced or it's associated with a depressed piece of cartilage, actually, that is not something you have to go after. Here's another one. Uh, again, tibial plateau fracture. There's your depressed fragment, uh, but just ignore that for a second. Look at that other fracture line, exiting there, exiting there. It's a posterolateral fracture. Are you going to go after it? Because you know damn well that when you put on that anterolateral locking plate that you're all going to be putting on this, it's not going to hit that fragment at all. Does it need fixing? Answer, certainly in my book, no, it doesn't. Because it's buttressed by the fibula, it's held in place. It's not going to move. Number one, you don't normally, unless it's very displaced, need to address the posterolateral fragment. Okay, but the posteromedial fragment has a totally different personality because the whole knee subluxes, the distal femur goes with the posteromedial fragment. Okay, if there's one take home message in this whole talk, that is it. The distal femur goes with the posterior medial fragment. And you can see it right there. Distal femur, the posterior medial fragment. And the, do you see how the whole femur's gone with it? And it's left the proximal tibia behind. There is no lateral tibial plateau fracture here. The lateral side's intact. But the knee, the distal femur, has pissed off off to the medial side with the medial tibial condyle. See it there on the model. And you see it over and over, but you see it in type 4, Schatzka type 4 injuries, and you see it in bicondylars. The distal femur falls off to the posteromedial side. Here you go, here's your standard Schatzka 4. There's the posteromedial fragment, there it is at the back. And here someone's fixed it. They fixed it, they tried to do a buttress plate. But look on the lateral side. See that discrepancy in diameter? That's not because there's something wrong with the lateral tibial plateau. The lateral tibial plateau is intact. It's just that if you don't put the tibia back where it belongs, you're not putting the knee back where it belongs. All right? So how do you fix it? Well, you basically analyze your CT, and you're looking for where the apex of the fracture is. Yeah, wherever that apex is, the metaphyseal apex, that's pretty much where your buttress, buttress plate belongs. And this one is pretty posterior, but they're not always posterior. Sometimes, they're, I mean, a lot of the time, they're either posterior medial or they're medial. So not everything needs a posterior approach. In fact, the vast majority don't. But that's how you analyze, that's how I, I analyze, how I make my decision as to whether I'm going in the back 
or I'm, I'm going supine and just going on the medial side. And do you need fancy plates? No, you don't. You don't need uh, lo super, locking, super locking technology. You can use pre-contour pre plates, but the principle is buttress. Another quick example of a distal femur going with a posterior medial fragment. This is a, a, a nasty bicondylar, but you can see the guy who put this frame on, what it needed was a, what it needed was a wire going through that posterior medial section of the knee. You know, that one that patients absolutely hate. Um, but because they didn't catch it, the knee is free to sublux posterior, posterior medially, and there it is. So, while you don't have to go after the posterior lateral fraction, you absolutely do have to go after the posterior medial fracture. And in the bicondylar situation, you are best to go for the medial side first because that puts your distal femur back where it belongs. It kind of reorientates your whole knee. It puts it back where, it's, where, it, where it needs to be, at which point you can then deal with your lateral side, which is now just a Schatzka II. All right? First half over. Technical tips. I'm just running through some stuff here. Um, first up, on the back of that previous section, the posterior medial approach. This is something that orthopods are classically quite scared of because, like, you know, it follows a massive Z-shaped incision as, like, blood vessels and everything. But actually using a posterior medial approach, which is now very well documented in the, in the uh, literature, it's, it's, uh, it's done on most cadaveric courses, um, where you're lifting up that medial head of gastroc and popliteus as one layer, it gives you the whole of the back of the tibia. Now you can see here there's lots of loops and things, this is the cadaveric section that the authors put forward. So they've, they've sifted out the, 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 the vessels, but in reality when you're doing this in, in the heat of battle, you don't need to take off the medial head of gastroc. You don't even need to see a vessel. So my advice to you is, the post-remedial approach gives you incredibly safe, reliable access to the whole of the back of the tibia. And if it's something you're not familiar with, it's actually really quite easy. So I would, next time opportunity you get to go on a cadaveric course to have a go at it, the patient is prone, um, I would definitely try and add this one to your repertoire, because it gives you much, much more options when you're fixing proximal tibial fractures, particularly by condylars, but also those tricky type fours. Number two, plateau and shaft. What do you do when you get this situation? A Schatzka II with uh, ipsilateral shaft. Uh, this particular one was uh, grade three A open. I'm just gonna run through what I did. Um, I, it was an open fracture, so it was, in that sense it was quite easy. So I just did a sloppy fixation of the shaft fracture just to stop it wobbling all around. That's after I've done my debridement with the plastic surgeons. Um, and then going after the tibial plateau. Knocking it up with my punch, there it comes. Um, and then having got my plate on, yes, I'm, I'm leaving those K-wires in. Sometimes I've, I, I, you know, I've got some threaded K-wires. If there are very small fragments of the plateau you want to hold, you can just shoot threaded K-wires through them. That holds pretty nicely. Um, and then I'm just nailing it, nailing straight past it. And although that seems very flash and you know, uh, MTC, actually uh, the, the nail passes very easily in front of a plate. So that's something anyone can do. It's not, that's not actually difficult in the slightest. Take home message, the nail easily sits in front of your plate. So an ipsilateral tibial shaft plateau, that's quite an elegant solution if you're not a frame guy. Number three. Okay, so you look at that tibial plateau and what I see there is it's been fixed, it looks like it's gone on to heel, doesn't it? And what you'll notice is the lateral side looks down to me. And you might say, well, perhaps it subsided, perhaps it fell down, but I suspect it came down because it was never really reduced in the first place. And there's a lot of discussion in orthopedics, in, in orthopedic trauma, about how you judge your reduction of a tibial plateau. And some people like doing a submeniscal uh, elevation, so you look at it with your eyes. Or you can put in a, 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 an arthroscope and look at it down the scope, brilliant. But there's two elements to reduction. One of them is getting the crazy paving back, right? So you're, getting, you're, you're bringing the, all the fragments up so they're level. So you've now got a flat surface. The other element of fixing a tibial plateau is getting, now you've got the pavement flat, 
is getting the pavement up to the right level. And that is not something you can do with your eyes or your arthroscope. It has to be radiological, okay? And so what I would suggest to you is once you put your plateau back together again, just consider either when you're putting it back together, over-reduce it and then let the femur push it down or have a punch to take it up and you're punching up, punching up all under II. And that's, that's my favorite technique. Otherwise, you tend to fix it low because you're trying to look for, use your, you're trying to see into the joints. And if you can see the joint, you probably haven't reduced it. So tibial height is radiological. Last one, quick case example. Um, uh, 36 year old dude, uh, a little bit unreliable. Uh, he's just got a Schatzka too. This is actually the same one I showed you earlier on the CT. Uh, you can see, uh, there's his, you've seen this one already. Um, there he is, and you can see it's, it's, it's your classic Schatzka too, in not particularly brilliant bone. He's got a depressed fragment right there uh, and a bit of a hole in his lateral plateau. And a, uh, a posterior lateral fragment, which I'm ignoring. So someone, undergo, he undergoes an operation and this is what it looks like post-operatively. And I'm thinking, well, that might be okay, but I, I suspect it's not. So we're getting a CT and that's what you see. Big old hole, looks like the fragment hasn't really been brought up. And what I wanted to share with you is what I did in this situation and uh, uh, what technical tips you can get from this. So there's your depressed fragment. Notice, I've, looking at the left-hand diagram, you'll see I've got my osteotome in. I've, I've whacked in an osteotome, not immediately under the dep depressed fragment, but way, way below it. And whenever you have, it does not just the tibial plateau, it's any, any bone, to peel on, any area which has got a big depressed fragment of bone, rather than going straight at the depressed fragment, go below it. So when you elevate it, you bring it up with a big column of bone. You can see that right-hand diagram. I've jacked my osteotome northwards now, but in doing so, I've stuffed this big raft of bone up underneath the depressed fragment. And so when your plate goes in, the thing sitting on the raft of screws is a layer of bone, not this like pretty fragile piece of articular cartilage. Number two. Uh, the reason I put this slide in was just to show you uh, the use of through and through KYs. I'm sure a lot of you do this anyway. This is, not, this is no great secret. A lot of people do this. So you see on that right-hand diagram, you've got two KYs where you've stuffed them in from the patient's, from the lateral side, but you've taken them out through the medial side. So they're now sitting just where you want them, but they're not pissing you off in the way of your plate. Next one, get the plate in early. I, I really strongly advise this. There is a temptation when reducing any fracture, to go after the, the, the articular bit and try and get that absolutely perfect. KY, 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 KY. And then you cannot get your hardware in properly. Now you can start snipping off KYs and, and working around it, but actually it's much easier to get your plate in very, very early on in proceedings, even before you've got a proper reduction. And then any KYs you put in are either put in through the plate or around the plate or in a, in a, in a plate where the plate is, isn't, isn't, isn't gonna cause a problem. And what I tend to do in the tibial plateau is that plate you're seeing on the right-hand diagram has been secured distally. I put one cortical screw right at the bottom of the plate. So now you can jack your, your tongs across the plate, squeeze the tibial plateau down, fine-tune it, take it off, put it on, take it off, put it on, until it's absolutely perfect. And then once you're happy, now you can fill it up with K-wires and the plate's not interfering. Last one. Look critically at your tibial width. One of the crucial, obviously you want to get the, the fragment up and you want to get the, the height of the, the plateau nice. But the other thing you want to do is tuck the edge of the plateau underneath the femur. Now you can look at my post-ops and you can say, actually that's still not quite right. There's still a little bit of tibia poking out from underneath the femur. I, I, I was very conscious to get as good as I had and that's, that's, what, that's what I'm putting up. But, it makes the point that if here is your distal femur, you're trying to get your tibia underneath it because that's where the meniscus is. And those are my technical tips. Last thing, I just want to share this with you because it drives me crazy when people at the trauma meeting say, 
like that last case I just showed you. Well, look, it's going to go on to total knee replacement anyway. Just let it heal up. Uh, it's, it's, it's all gone to crap. Let it heal up, and I'll put a total knee replacement in, it, uh, you know, in a few years' time. If you look at how many patients go, who have tibial plateau, plateau fractures go on to have a knee replacement, it might surprise you. This is a massive study from the American Journal, 8,000 patients. It's a retrospe retrospective data trawl, but it's a 10-year follow-up. These are operatively treated tibial plateaus, all comers, bicondylar, unicondylar. I want you to put a number in your head. How many people do you think, at 10 years average, ended up with a knee replacement after their operatively treated tibial plateau fracture? 7.3%. Unbelievable. But it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? If you think back to your, your knee job, you know, when you were doing, uh, working with the, the knee guy, or maybe you are the knee guy, how many of your knee replacements are old tibial plateau fractures that now have all gone to, gone to arthritis? The bottom line is, if you do a good job, osteoarthritis is unlikely. In summary, OA is not inevitable, even in the most minging of tibial plateaus. Differentiate in your head on the CT the difference between postrolateral and postromedial. Bicondylars, go medial first because that is the, that is the heart of the fracture. Reduction is ultimately radiological in getting tibial height back and a nail dust it in front of a plate. Thank you.